Okay, hello again, and this will be the 10th and sort of final of the um, DVDs in the le lecture series. I believe that I will probably make an extra one for those of you who need some assistance with assignments. There'll be some assignments, extra tapes for those of you who would like to watch those. Um, but today what we're going to do is continue with our discussion of doing program evaluation. And last time we were discussing, first we talked about doing needs assessment and the process of doing that and the purpose of doing that. And then we talked about how is it that if you want a grant that you could get money for a grant and how would you find one and how would you apply for it and what do you include in it and what are the differences among different types of grants and so forth. And now we're actually going to go to this idea of evaluating your program. And one of the most important things about evaluating the program as I talked about in the needs assessment is that many times before anybody will ever free up money for you to run a program, you need to tell them how you are going to know by the time the program's over whether or not that program has actually completed its mission effectively. So that if your program has goals, what are those goals and you need to know those in the beginning and how are you going to know if you are meeting those goals? And one of the things that we will talk about here is the idea of people look at programs with sort of two different lenses. One is a formative evaluation and one is called the summative part of the evaluation. And if we've talked in here earlier about process and outcome, process is the doing of something, outcome is the impact that that has. And with a program, the formative evaluation is measuring how is the program going. The summative is what is the impact or the effect that the program has had. And what is the effect it's had on the participants, the actual people who were in the program, what is the effect it's had on the community itself? Assuming that it's a program which is anticipated to have a community impact as well as a participant impact. And so as you're setting up your goals, for your program, you kind of want to think about what do we hope that this program does? And your evaluation measures, did we meet those goals? Did we do what it is that we wanted to do? And as you're sitting there with your RFP, your request for proposal, looking at these are the people who are funding this kind of program and this is what they want the program to look like, and we have to tell them how in the heck are we going to know if we've done our job and how well we've done our job. So you really have to process this stuff long in advance to the end of the program, which may not be for three, four, five more years after you've applied for the money. But you need to get the wheels turning now. So when your agency is thinking about going for some money, that's the time to bring on board somebody who knows something about program evaluation. And the reality is that for many of you watching this tape, that will be you. <laughs> now, your agency has a choice, as I have here. Um, who does the evaluation? Do we have someone in-house, someone who works for the agency? Or do we bring in a consultant or an expert from the outside? And we'll talk about pluses and minuses of doing that. You would be more likely the in-house person, although some of you, especially if you go in and get a PhD in social work research, you could be the consultant or expert. And this can be a wonderful, wonderful asset that you can bring to a lot of small communities like Walla Walla is the ability to evaluate a program. Because, as I said, if you have to know at the get-go what how it is you're going to know how well your program is working, then you want that person, that expert, that person who's going to help you evaluate it to be there at the grant development stage, if at all possible, so that they can help you not only analyze your data, but tell you what data to collect and what data you might want to analyze it and how you might do that. So really kind of this isn't a linear process where we have, we see a need and we, you know, have an idea for a program and we do a needs assessment and we look through the RFPs and we write a grant and we run the program and then we measure it. It's far more of a circular 
kind of process where we're continually assessing and thinking and processing and how are we going to evaluate it and what do we learn from the evaluation to improve the program and how do the needs in the community change and so it's an iterative circular kind of process rather than a linear thing so sort of knowing at the beginning where you're going in the process is actually quite helpful that said let us walk through this in a more linear kind of fashion so as I said you often need to know and to describe to the people who are going to fund you through grants through taxes through how through whatever how it is you're going to know did this program work so if we think about who does the evaluation the and again you try to have this conversation right there when you're thinking about wow if i look around the walla walla valley there really seems to be a lot of trouble with kids with too much time on their hands after school so let us return to the program that we've sort of been using as an example through this process so you recognize that need you've done the needs assessment you found that your community a perceives that they really do need this program and b they would really support such a program if you were to have such a thing so you've identified a need you've done a needs assessment you've found a some foundation that any Casey foundation says yeah let's let's do some stuff with older kids not just little kids but let's let's do some stuff with older kids so you've applied for this grant from Annie Casey or a grant from the federal government or a grant from the state of Washington or from somewhere and in the grant proposal it says how are you gonna know if the Walla Walla Valley is a better place as a result of having this after-school program for teenage kids so do you want to hire someone inside of your agency or do you want to bring in the hotshot expert from the university or from the outside? So let's talk about the relative pluses and minuses of these. The in-house person is someone who works for your agency, oftentimes works for the program, although could work for the agency and not the program specifically, although they would be working for the program once they were doing the evaluation. Benefits of the in-house person is often people perceive, if we look at benefits, a big perceived benefit is the money thing. Now, is this a real benefit or not? That's questionable, but usually people figure we're already paying your salary, and so we don't have to hire somebody from the outside, and the agency might not have money to bring someone from the outside in. So uh, then it seems like hiring someone in the agency is the best thing to do. However, if you get a grant to evaluate your program, you actually could put that in the budget. So the money not, might not be such a big deal. The other thing is you have to remember if you hire someone from your agency to do a program evaluation, then that person is not doing whatever it was that they were doing for the agency and you might need to hire their replacement depending on how much time they're going to spend doing this. So is their salary really, um, it, 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 is it cheap, that much cheaper than bringing in the expert? And do they have the knowledge and expertise that they can do it as efficiently as someone brought in from the outside? That's usually the biggest sort of perceived drawback or one of the drawbacks is does anybody in your agency have the knowledge necessary to write up how you would do a program evaluation to even conceptualize how would we know if our after-school program for teens is working do do we have people who are good enough at evaluating programs to say this is how we will evaluate it not that they'd necessarily be able to do it, but to even envision how it would be done. And then, a year down the pike, three years down the pike, five years down the pike, do they have the statistical savvy or this, the knowledge to make sense of all of this information that you've gathered? So can they tell you what information needs to be gathered? And can they then make sense of entering it into a computer, perhaps analyzing it in SPSS or some data analysis program, and writing up? Um, the project. Sometimes agencies have people who are extremely good at that. Other agencies have nobody who can do that. So do you have somebody with the knowledge? If you don't, you need to hire the expert because that can make the difference between getting a grant and not getting a grant. 
Another benefit of having somebody from your agency can be nobody knows a program better than the people who are intimately involved in it. So that someone from the agency just experiences things on an inside level. They see every day how the program runs. They see you know, the kids, they know the workers. And that's oftentimes a far better sense of, so this is knowledge of research. However, they often have a better knowledge of the program than does the hotshot from the university who comes in you know, for a few visits while you're writing the grant and then comes in at the end and collects a lot of paperwork, takes it home, sits there in front of his or her computer and analyzes it. So people from the inside may be way more knowledgeable about the program. Well, what about a consultant? Do we hire the expert? Well, the drawbacks sort of, benefits and drawbacks here sort of reverse. So people will see that the, a benefit of bringing in someone from the outside is they do tend to have better knowledge or expertise of how to do research than somebody who is um, working as a full-time clinician might have knowledge of research. However, they don't know your program as well, so they may not know exactly the ins and outs and all the nuances the same way. A big perceived benefit, however, of bringing in the consultant, and this is why the vast majority of people who can write this person into the grant or afford to hire this person will hire a consultant, is you have this perception of vested interest. And people worry very much that if you have somebody who works for the program, evaluating the program, that what's going to happen is that person can't help but be biased and that bias can't help but be in favor of, but of course, the program is wonderful. After all, I work in this program. Would I work in a program that wasn't wonderful? This is the best program on the planet. And there's this big worry that if you work for something, it's very hard to be objective, to be detached, and to see sort of the wrinkles or problems, or maybe you see them, but you want to gloss them over, and you certainly don't want to write about them and tell them to the Annie E. Casey Foundation or the state of Washington, which is funding it. You kind of want to slip those under the carpet and pretend there are no problems and that everything is rosy. So the perception is that the outside expert will be able to be far more objective about what's going well and about what the shortcomings are of the program. Now the question is, are they? Well, sometimes they probably are. And sometimes they might not be. If you're in the agency, you may see the wrinkles and you may see the problems in the program and you may be a quite honest person and share those with the people who are funding you. If you're the outside consultant, you may know that your paycheck is being funded by the agency. And that if you say bad things, you're not going to get a paycheck from them. Or you may get a paycheck for this job, but next time they want to hire an expert from the university to come uh, you know, measure and evaluate the next program, you're certainly not going to be on their list. And as a matter of fact, they may go to lunch and say, oh, we heard that Von der Feck from Walla Walla College, and she says terrible things about our program. If you ever need to hire consultants, put her off the list. And although formal blacklisting is not legal, informal, small town people talk, it happens. So it may be that your expert from the university or from the think tank really does sort of have a vested interest in telling you what it is and telling the grant foundation what it is that you want them to hear. Maybe not to the extent of the in-house person, but maybe almost to the extent. So the idea that this person is completely non-biased is probably a myth. Are they more objective? Perhaps. Now let's say that you choose to go with a consultant. If you choose to go in-house, you choose to go in-house. And some grants won't even allow you to choose in-house. Some will. If you're in-house, the rest is a little less relevant to that person because it would happen more naturally. If you bring in the expert who does not work at your agency regularly, who may or may not know people in your agency, maybe a total stranger, you here at Walla Walla College and you hire somebody from the UW, so they fly in or drive in from Seattle. They don't know Walla Walla nearly as well as people who work here. Ideally, if you want to have the best relationship with this person so that they're A, as helpful as they can possibly be, and B, everybody is as happy 
with the outcome, whatever the outcome is, as can possibly be. For one, you want to call the consultant in from the get-go. So rather than, you know, sort of do the needs assessment, um, look through the RFPs, apply for the grant, you know, write your evaluation, send it off, get the grant, bring it back, run your program, and then you got this whole pile of data and you say, oh, now it's time to hire a consultant. And you get on the telephone and you talk to WSU and you talk to UW and you find someone and they come in and your program is three and a half years down the line and the data is due, you know, in six months or a year and they look and they say, oh my goodness, this is the data? These are the questions? These are your goals? This data doesn't begin to really evaluate your program at all. I don't know how I can begin to tell you whether or not you're meeting your goals based on this information. It just doesn't match. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, you're feeling your stomach drop and you're thinking, oh my goodness, three and a half years and three and a half million dollars into a five million dollar grant and now we learn that all the data we've gathered is useless. Ouch. <laughs> the cold chill runs through you. You're picturing, you know, the governor of Washington or the, you know, the foundation person saying, well, we're not going to fund the last one and a half million. As a matter of fact, we want you to sign a paycheck to sign over the last three and a half million, which probably wouldn't happen. But nonetheless, these are the sinking feelings and the spooky self-talk you can have when the expert says that all the data you've gathered is completely worthless. How do you avoid that? Include them from the start. So if you know you're going to hire somebody from the outside, maybe before you even do the needs assessment, just have them come over, take a look. Agencies which do a lot of grant writing often have a couple people sort of, not on retainer, but sort of, you know, that they know that they'll get called, they come in, you, you pay them out of your pocket, you know, several hundred dollars or more in order to help you, you know, figure out what should we do for a needs assessment and how would we evaluate this program if it was running? So, you know, they're there by telephone, they're there by email, and they come and they visit the agency and they see the community and they meet everybody. And it may cost you some upfront money, but at the same time you get the grant and then they say, okay, well I think that the kind of information that you would want to gather to tell you if this program for we're, you know, doing something with kids after school from 3 o'clock until 7 o'clock, you know, the five school days a week, in order to say, is that really making a difference? I think this is the kind of data that you want to gather. And so before you've ever had the first kid stay after school and do the first activity, you know this is the kind of information that we need in the end to say, yes, the program is effective, or yeah, it's got its pluses and minuses, it's sort of so-so, or oh, this program really is off the mark, maybe we need to switch it in order to benefit the community. So as much as people can come in from the start, the other thing is it forms relationships. If you're evaluating a program, oftentimes it does require you know, collecting information, which means paperwork. And most people who go into human services do not go into human services Oh, I love paperwork so much. I want to become a social worker because I hear from every social worker how much paperwork they get to do, so this is the career for me. They go into social work like, oh, I love being with people. Oh, yeah, and there's all this paperwork i got to do. So if the expert comes in and there's going to be a bunch of paperwork because you got to gather data in order to keep the money flowing, in order to keep serving your clients, if there is a relationship with the consultant and she can say, you know, I really think you need to gather this kind of information. You need to give out, you know, these sort of pre-tests and post-tests. You need to gather, you know, maybe if the kids could self-monitor this and you could have them, you know, do some goal attainment scaling here and you could get this information from the police station and so forth. And the reason for it is this, that, and the other thing. At least you know from the beginning that, okay, we're going through these goal attainment scales and they're kind of tedious, but I see the purpose. And yeah, we have to do these pre-post tests and yeah, they're kind of tedious, but I see the purpose. And so it gives the clinicians and the people who are running the program an appreciation of the importance and the why is it that we need to do all of this paperwork, data gathering kind of stuff, instead of just having somebody come in and say, here's a stack of papers, make sure everybody does them. 
So, you know, this is why you need to do this, and this is why you need to do this, and this is the purpose of this, and we, the best way to get this information is like this. So it's just a working relationship, collaborating from the beginning. The other thing is that let's say if your program goes wonderfully and your outcomes are great, everybody's thrilled, you know, the, the consultant becomes your best friend, you take them out to a fine dinner at 26 Bricks, assuming that doesn't mean a like conflict of interest kind of thing, and everybody's very pleased. But let's say that your program really doesn't seem to be able to demonstrate that it's done anything of value whatsoever. It's far better for the consultant and for you to have a collaborative working give and take relationship with ongoing communication so that you don't have the consultant come in, do this whole big program evaluation, write up a report, put a copy in the mail, off on the FedEx, you know, to Washington, to Olympia, to the NE Casey Foundation headquarters, wherever that may be, to wherever you're getting your money, and hand you another copy of the report, and you're reading it at the same time as, you know, the Feds in Bethesda, Maryland are reading it, and it says, well, this program was really a huge waste of the taxpayer's money, or, you know, the foundation really next time needs to spend its money differently because this program was absolutely worthless. Well, why didn't my expert tell me this before the piece, you know, before this document hit the mail? So ideally, in a collaborative relationship, if the consultant is finding that things just aren't going as well as you would like them to, you have an open relationship where he or she can say, you know, I'm kind of worried about this. It looks like from the preliminary, you know, information coming in, it really looks like we're not meeting the needs as well as we could or you know we're supposed to have this after-school soccer program nobody's nobody's there if nobody's playing soccer how do we expect after-school soccer is gonna keep kids from doing after-school sex and drugs they gotta be on the soccer field in order for it to matter and let's talk about maybe how come they're not. So you want to sort of have this give and take. What is the consultant learning? How can he or she share that with you? How can you take that information and make your program better? Again, it's the circular, circular iterative process instead of the linear process where you get zingered at the end. And the more open-ended it is, the more you can hopefully change things as they're going along or at least be prepared for whatever the outcome is when the outcome is there. So. That's kind of the who. Now to talk a little bit about this idea of formative and summative evaluations and then to use our program as an example. As I said earlier, the formative part of your program evaluation has to do with the process of your program. Is the program running the way we anticipate the program should run? The summative has to do with the outcome or the impact of your program. Is this program having the effect on the participants, which would be the kids, perhaps their families? Is it having the impact on the community, if it's a program which we hope will have an impact on the community? That we hope it will. So formative, is it running the way we hope? Summative. Is it having the impact on the participants and on the community? So let's talk a couple of the specifics. If this is our after school program for teens, what might we expect to be in the formative part of our program? Well, this would depend. And when I teach this class face to face, we usually develop a program sort of interactively in class. What would be the goals? What would be the things we would want to include in the program? And then how would you measure them formatively and summatively? So let us say, and if you go on D2L, there will be a copy of a program. So let us say that you look and imagine that we have created this program. Well, what are some of the things that you would want to have in a program for teens after school? So earlier I was talking about soccer. So let's say we have soccer and other sports. So soccer, tennis, football. Let's say there's just sort of a sports component. And let's say another thing would be a homework help. 
and we've got you know a room at the library or we've rented out a couple rooms at Whitman College or something and we have a couple fairly academically talented young adults maybe from the colleges who go around and help kids with their homework so you can help them with writing help them with math um, help them with whatever homework they they may need as well as just have a nice quiet place to go so we've got homework help let's say that we decide we want to have some sort of counseling services and the counseling services kids are having a tough time you know here's someone it's a you're here already here's someone who you could talk to and your parents don't even necessarily depending on how we would have you know the parents need to sign off or not but if we could get through ethics that the parents wouldn't necessarily need to sign off on this this would be a nice place kids would be there they could have a counselor the parents wouldn't have to pay for it it's paid for by our grants and so forth so let's just say that these are three components we could you know, go through a, a whole list but let's say these are three components if we're going to evaluate these formatively that's is the pro is the process of the program doing what we hope well for soccer what is it that we need to have in place in order to have soccer after school well we need a soccer field so have we been able to talk with one of the schools to talk with the community at the community soccer field area do we have a place do we have a field that the kids can use now let's say that we use the fields out in Eastgate how are we going to get kids from Wahai or from Pioneer Middle School or Garrison out to those soccer fields? Well, if we're going to ha have soccer fields, we need to get kids to the soccer fields. So that might require a field. We will need transportation. In order to have soccer, it might be helpful to have a coach or coaches there so this would be for soccer for tennis the same thing we need to get you know tennis courts from one of the schools tennis courts from Whitman tennis courts somewhere football same thing need to have a place need to have a way to get kids to and from need to have coaches there so those are the things that we need to have in place before we can do this once we have all these things in place what else do we need well of course we need kids if kids are here the other things aren't here it doesn't doesn't do us any good but we also need kids once everything is in place so the formative evaluation would be do we have the field can we get the kids to and from the field do we have the coaches and are kids showing up if you got two kids showing up to play soccer you haven't got a team much less a team with an opponent that you can actually play so you sort of look for all of these components and how are they doing if we need homework help do we again have a place where kids can go do we have tutors you might want to have supplies and then again the kids actually need to show up so you might have this lovely building somewhere downtown somewhere at Whitman you might have some very talented college kids who are wanting to have volunteer time and so they show up for free to help high school and middle school kids after school with their homework you may have a bunch of pencils and you know lined paper and some computer terminals and stuff set up kids say oh it's so lame doing homework after school I'd really rather go home listen to rock music smoke dope and have sex with my girlfriend or boyfriend well okay homework help is a great idea but if nobody's showing up then it's not doing you very much good so formatively is all this stuff in place counseling services same thing you need people who are either professional counselors or trained listeners if you wanted to have a peer counseling kind of thing and you would decide how you wanted to set that program up and our kids showing up so the formative is are the things in place that we need to have in place in order to run the program in days gone by formative evaluation was pretty much and the buck stops here if you said yeah we have soccer you know we have sports fields we have coaches we have transportation and kids are playing the program is working look we have you know 80 kids and you do a head count we have 80 kids playing sports every day after school we have 15 kids showing up for homework help and we have about eight kids who intermittently show up for counseling services so the program must be working okay it says that kids are utilizing the services 
And in the days when formative evaluation was the buck stops here, you've done a formative evaluation, the services are in place and people are doing it, cool. But somewhere in the 80s and 90s, as I talked about way back when on, I think, the first DVD, that stopped being good enough. It started being now, but is it working? Does it matter? Do we not only have kids showing up to play sports, have kids showing up for homework, have kids showing up for counseling. Does it matter? Well, does it matter? This gets to our summative. This is our outcome. This is our impact. So then we say, well, okay, if the kids do after school sports, they do after school homework, they do after school counseling, and let's say, you know, we had some sort of just relatively safe hangout where we might have snacks and we might have music and we might have, you know, just a couple, again, college kids or adults, sort of making sure that the kids weren't, you know, like smoking dope and having sex there. So they were hanging out, but they were hanging out and remaining reasonably psychologically and physically healthy at, at the same time and not pregnant. Um, so you've got all these, what do we hope is the outcome or impact of this? And what do we hope is the impact on the participants as well as perhaps on the community itself. So if we look first at the kids, well, what would I hope that kids would get out of sports? And then what, how do we measure that? How do we document that? So let's say one of the things that we help kids get out of sports is they're physically active, you know? They are physically fit and maybe more physically fit than they were when they would go home and hang out in front of the tube and eat chips and uh, have their, um, listen to their iPod. So could we do a pre-post? Could we do some sort of measure of, um, you know, get the fat calipers and see, by, you know, body lean mass and body fat? Could we weigh kids before and after? Well, that might not work. You might need to do a height, weight, and a um, body mass index on kids if you were looking for health as indicated by body fat and as indicated by body mass index. You could do some sort of um, aerobic capacity test if you really, really wanted you know, physical fitness to be uh, a high importance here. So if you were looking at we want to get kids moving after school instead of vegging, then what do we hope that movement will do? Well, it'll make them leaner, meaner, tougher, healthier, and so forth. How do you measure that? Um, you, so would you do you know, the, the sort of physical things I was looking at? Let's say homework help. Well, what do you expect homework help is going to do? Well, the most obvious thing is, well, kids will get their homework done. And if kids get their homework done, what's the benefit of that? Well, their grades assumedly would go up. A large portion of kids' grades um, in classes these days seems to be due to can I actually turn homework assignments in? And sometimes up to 50% of the grade in a teacher's class is just based on bringing homework assignments in that have been done adequately. If a kid scores 100 on every test and doesn't turn in any homework, many times that kid fails. So if we look at grades, for school. If we have a kid who is getting D's and F's and that kid is now getting B's and C's and it's because they're doing their homework and they're turning in their homework and then the assumption is if I do my homework I actually learn something and so my grades on the test would improve too. So some would just be turning it in, some would be actually learning better. So are these kids doing better in terms of homework in? You could just look at that pre-post with the teachers. Are they doing better on their exams? You could look at that pre-post. Again, look at their grades, look at the sort of progress reports teachers send out with all the grades on all the different assignments. Counseling services. Well, here would be where with the kids who went to counseling services, you might be able to use a variety of the tools that we've used. You know, you could do, um, if kids come in for depression, do depression indices. If kids are stressed, do stress tests, do, you know, pre-post psychological inventories. If um, you're looking for just a safe hangout. Well, what would a safe hangout necessarily demonstrate? Ah, brainstorm and, you know, think, think how this would work. With each of these, one might say, well, you know, would we like some holistic measure of are these kids happier, are these kids healthier? 
And so whether that could be done through a self-monitoring, whether that would be done through some sort of you know, pre-post psychological standardized test of um, number of negative symptoms kids are having or of a life satisfaction kind of test, would we want you know, kids to set goals for themselves? How is it you would want to measure this stuff? But would you want to do an A, B where the kids you know, sort of measure some aspects of their you know, general satisfaction with life for the months before they do the program and the first month after the program? There's like all sorts of ways that you could measure the impact on the kids of participating in the program, piece by piece or overall. There's also a community impact that is part of many programs. So if we're talking about we want to have this program for kids because A, it's good for kids. B, it's good for families. You know, parents who don't have to sit there at work at 4 o'clock and say, oh, I have to be here, you know, until 5.30 today, but I know that my teenage kids are, oh, I don't know what my teenage kids are doing, but I worry that my teenage kids are getting into really bad trouble. You know, or the mom says, oh, my son just got out of rehab and he's home all by himself and he's unsupervised and I know his old, you know, drinking buddies and drugging buddies are going to be there. I wish he had a safe place. So mom is much happier. Dad is much happier. They know that their kid is in a safe place. And are the kids happier? Well, the other thing is, in terms of the community, if we were worried that kids need something healthy to do because we see youth crime rates are up. So we had statistics from the police. We had statistics from juvie. Do those statistics change? Do we have fewer kids who are getting picked up by the cops? Do we have fewer kids in juvie? If we have this belief that there's a lot of teens who become pregnant because, well, sex is a great thing to do after school when mom and dad are both at work and there's nobody going to be home until about 6 or 7 at night. Well, suddenly the kid is in this after school program. Ooh, the time that is available with a nice easy way to have sex is suddenly gone. Do teen pregnancy rates drop as a result of the boys and the girls who might be having sex being now playing soccer and, you know, sort of hanging out in a safer environment with some adult supervision? So is there a drop in youth crime? Is there a drop in teenage pregnancy? Is there an improvement in school grades? Is there an improvement in graduation rate? So these are things which can be measured on a broader basis, as well as the smaller things that can be measured just on each participant who's doing the program. And both of those are sort of counted in the summative. The formative is important not only just to sort of see what's in place, but if the summative isn't working, you know, if it doesn't seem like counseling services are making a big difference, kids' mental health scores, kids' anxiety and stress is still the same, but then you realize that you have a counselor and she sits there hour after hour after hour and nobody ever talks to her. Oh, counseling services only help when someone shows up. If no one goes for homework help, well, if you don't see grades changing, well, gosh, you know we have this homework help for kids every day after school. Why is it grades aren't changing? Well, only one or two kids are ever there and it's the same two kids and nobody else shows up. Ah, okay, well, how come that is? Well, we don't have any tutors. The kids don't know how to do the homework and they sit there and they're frustrated and they can't help each other. So we need to get some more qualified tutors. So sometimes the formative can tell you and lead you to how come we're not getting the data we're wanting. So if the data doesn't look good, if you've got this, okay, well, we don't have tutors or we have tutors who are really good at writing, but no tutor who is good at math has shown up, and so nobody can do more than sixth grade math, so all the kids from seventh grade on up don't have anybody to help them out. That's important formative information to know, which is not only going to change formative, it may well change some of your outcomes. So that's kind of the putting it all together. Then, of course, you got to organize it and write it up. But ideally, it tells you, are the pieces of my program in place, and is it making a difference? And if it's not, again, in the iterative process, you look at the formative. If things aren't going the way we hope, then can we tighten them and have them go the way we hope? You know, if we don't have tutors who know how to do math, if there aren't any coaches, if we can't get the kids to the soccer field, what good is having a soccer field? So uh, is it that, or is all of this stuff going beautifully, but it doesn't make a difference? And if all this stuff is going beautifully and we can't show that it matters, then we say, something's wrong with our theory. If our theory was kids leave school 
They go home, there's no supervision, they do all sorts of stuff to get in trouble, it causes problems for them, and causes problems for the community. So if we could give kids healthy social things to do, then we wouldn't have these problems. But now kids are doing all these healthy social things, they're still flunking out of school, they're still dropping out of school, they're still getting pregnant, they're still getting picked up and arrested, they're still having lots of drinking, drugging problems. Hmm, it must not be the after school, what is the thing? But at least it serves you, quest sends you questioning, in a new direction instead of trying the same old, same old, you know the same old is doing as much as it can, it's just not having the impact you want. And so those are some really important questions because as social service providers, we certainly don't want to spend our time and energy doing things that don't work. We want to spend our time and energy doing things that do work. So if it's not working, why isn't it working? Is it that we're not doing it well? Or if we're doing it well and it still doesn't have an impact, then let's learn from that so we can learn to do something else that does work, that's good for our clients, it's good for us, and it hopefully means that people will appreciate that social service providers really can do this prevention stuff, really can help improve the quality of people's lives, and that's kind of what we're in this business for. And that is the end of this TAPE 10 program evaluation.